John. Uh, John is a uh, is in the transportation structures. Part, he is the transportation structures department manager for AECOM Raleigh office. He graduated from Virginia Military Institute in 2002 with a BS in civil engineering, where he also played on the baseball team. And uh, he graduated from NC State with an MS in structural engineering. So we've had a pretty good conference. We've got a lot of NC State people listed up here. So all right, so that's right. Uh, where he investigated the seismic behavior of reinforced concrete at low temperatures. He began working for AECOM in 2004 and has completed numerous feasibility, design, inspection, and rehabilitation projects. Outside of the office, he enjoys spending time with his family, walking on the Greenway, reading books, and coaching youth sports, which I have some experience with, and that might be one of the hardest things I, I do. So, No doubt. Welcome. Heard, heard the cats out on the field. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you inviting me to come and present this project at the conference. And uh, thanks also to everyone at, here in West Virginia for all your hospitality. It's been a really outstanding conference. So I'm here to talk to you about a historic arch bridge in central North Carolina. It was built in 1927. And this past year, we did a feasibility study to see if we could not only rehabilitate it, but also widen it. But before I talk about that project, I want to talk to you about a project that we did previously. Uh, this is in Knoxville, Tennessee. We did this for TDOT. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, joints. Yes, somebody mentioned yesterday TDOT and uh, their desire to eliminate joints. Um, so uh, this bridge, what we did was we removed the, the uh, completely removed the superstructure, rehabilitated the arch ribs and the piers. This shows you a picture of the structure during construction and then the finished product. So this, this bridge uh, is 1,720 feet long. It only has two joints in it, one at each end bent. So um, they definitely wanted to eliminate all the joints there. So we basically uh, talked to NCDOT about a year and a half ago and said, hey, can we do this for this bridge here? Uh, which is uh, in Stanley County, not far from Charlotte. It's 800 and uh, it's got four arch spans. Each one is 210 feet long. Um, so a total of 840 feet. It's got a few approach spans on each end. Um, just to kind of go over some terminology, we've got uh, the spring line is down here. We've got the arch piers, crown of the arch rib, spandrel, columns and spandrel bent. Um, I'll be using those terms uh, throughout the, the presentation. So this shows a picture of the bridge during construction, 1926-27 uh, time frame. It got a, basically a, a steel frame using to uh, construct the bridge. This shows the predecessor bridge. Um, there's a really neat story about uh, this structure and how uh, it was built uh, just a few years prior to the current bridge that we're evaluating, but they had to tear it down because they built a dam downstream to create the lake. You notice there's a, a big lake there in the existing, uh, with the existing bridge, and then you get here, there's no lake. Um, so they decided to build a lake downstream to create a dam, generate power, so this bridge was too low, it was gonna be impounded by the lake. Um, so they handed it over to the army and the army uh, went out and had some planes, dropped some bombs on it and uh, shelled it with cannon fire. And uh, there's actually a, a neat YouTube video that I'll show you at the end. Uh, you can see uh, uh, some of the footage of that. It's, it's actually a really fascinating story. So this shows uh, the project location, the little white star there in the middle, um, not far from Charlotte. We've only got 20 feet between curbs on the existing bridge. This was a two-lane bridge for most of its life. Um, you know, again, built in 1927, just for reference there, that's the year that Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs. So for you baseball fans, that's a you know point of reference there. But, um, it, it carried two lanes of traffic until the parallel bridge was constructed in the 1970s, this bridge here. Um, and then it carried, from that time, for 
two decades or more, it carried two lanes in the westbound direction. Currently, it only carries one lane. So we wanted to see, you know, a, a huge aspect of this is can we actually widen, widen the project. Um, this shows some of the architectural details that we wanted to preserve. Um, big question here is how do you maintain the historic architecture there while also widening, getting farther out, having a larger cantilever? Um, those are some of the questions we wanted to answer. Back in the planning phase, uh, this wasn't even considered. Uh, the two alternate alternatives that were considered were, number one, completely remove the structure and just put a conventional structure in its place. Uh, that's, that's this one uh, alternative is shown. Then the next alternative was to keep the existing structure in place uh, while building a, a third parallel bridge to the south of the two existing bridges. Um, the arch bridge was going to, under this all scenario, the arch bridge was going to be uh, transferred, ownership was going to be transferred to the land trust for central North Carolina. Um, and it, it was all worked out. They were going to move forward with this alternative, but uh, there were some political shenanigans going on uh, all the way up to the General Assembly. There was some legislation tucked into a bill that said, uh, made it prohibitive. Uh, I don't know all the details, but it made it prohibitive for the land trust to take ownership of the bridge. So um, NCDOT was kind of back to the drawing board, but some of the residents got together and were doing some research. They really liked this bridge. They wanted to preserve it. So they, they found out what we had done in Knoxville and said, hey, why can't we do that? Um, is it possible to uh, you know, do, uh, remove the superstructure and actually widen the bridge? Uh, and more importantly, can we do it economically and also, can we provide a complete 75-year design life in accordance with Ashto LRFD? We don't want to do this for just 20 years. Uh, you know, you, we, want a, we want a full life cycle out of, this, uh, out of this project. So that brings us to the feasibility study. Those are the main questions we, that we sought to ask. Uh, this is a feasibility study team. NCDOT uh, contracted with us directly and each of these partners directly. We were kind of providing um, overall direction, scope definition for everybody. Um, but infrastructure's here. They did the underwater dive inspection. Sivas here at the conference. He helped us out with um, basically service life analysis, corrosion protection, material testing. So uh, they both did a great job for us. We looked at load rating the existing structure, load rating of a proposed structure, and we did all the above water inspection and, and evaluation. And we, we also brought everything together in a final feasibility study document. As we got started, this shows kind of what we had to work with. This is uh, the first sheet in the existing plan set. So you kind of stare into that and you say, to yourself, is that a seven or is that a nine? Um, but uh, the, the plans are pretty difficult to read, but we were able to work through it. You get out your magnifying glass and uh, you know, I think for the most part, you're able to figure it out. This is what we proposed for the superstructure. The dash line shows you what's there existing, reinforced concrete deck girders. Uh, again, only 20 feet wide in between curbs. We wanted to go all the way out to 36 feet between rails. Um, looking at precast panels uh, on the edge there to, to mimic uh, the existing uh, fascia as, as well as we had to extend the cap. That's what we looked at. I'll, I'll just point out too, You've got significantly higher loads, significantly higher dead loads, but we, you can use that to your advantage because we're working with a concrete arch. Uh, the compression in the arch is a significant benefit, so you have to figure out how to use that additional load to your benefit. The other thing we have going on here is uh, our superstructure is significantly stiffer than the original, so we're also using that to our benefit um, so that the superstructure is relieving some of the load that's on the arch rib. 
This shows uh, interaction diagram at the spring line. We've got axial load uh, with moment. We actually, you increase demand. That's uh, the original uh, structure is the orange dot there. And then the second round with the proposed structure is the green triangle. The blue line is the capacity curve. So as you can see here, we've got an increased load, but we're farther away from the curve. So we've actually improved the performance with the proposed structure. That's at the, this is at the spring line, again, uh, near the base of the arch. Towards uh, the, the other critical point was uh, at the third points, um, because there were joints in the existing superstructure um, of the bridge there. So we were able to significantly improve performance there by eliminating two expansion joints within each span at one third of the arch, arch span. That brings us to the inspection. Um, the, there were joints, uh, as I mentioned, at third, third points and also at the piers. Um, arch piers were not in good condition, especially the higher up you went. Uh, a lot of salts getting in there, a lot of spalls, d lambs, cracks, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's one of the arch pier caps. That's on the outside of the arch piers. <clears throat> a lot of deterioration there. Very, uh, SEVA's uh, evaluation showed very high chlorides in these areas. Um, but the farther you go down, uh, the better the condition of the structure. You go down and uh, you see a lot of this cracks parallel to a corner. You know, again, this is indicating that the chlorides have already gotten into the longitudinal steel there. Um, just as a side note, um, don't recommend a crack injection here. Uh, I don't think it's going to benefit you because uh, it's just going to progress, you're going to get this condition where you've got a delamination and then you're going to progress to the spall. That, those three photos just show the progression of deterioration, um, cracks, uh, delam, and then spall. Um, this condition was prevalent throughout the piers above, above the spring line. Below water, again, infrastructure in engineers did this. They took an acoustic image. I thought this was a really neat image. You can see some debris um, down on the bottom right there, a little bit of footing exposure. But all in all, underwater, this bridge was in really excellent, excellent condition. Um, not much uh, underwater. At the water line, they did find some, uh, a little bit of scaling exposed aggregate and such, so we're going to have to repair this. We're going to uh, do a concrete jacket for, um, for this. Uh, we looked at different materials, epoxy material, cementitious material, reinforce it or do a, something really thin. I think we're going to go with a thicker epoxy material um, that's reinforced actually and uh, connected with powder actuated fasteners. That's what we're uh, planning on at this point. So that, that was the piers. That brings me to the arch ribs. I don't know if you can tell why I wanted to show this photo yet, but if you look really closely, you can see the grain of the formwork wood. Um, that's a beautiful sight for a bridge inspector, bridge engineer, for a 90-year-old structure. Uh, that's, that's a thing of beauty right there. Um, so this was actually pretty prevalent, especially if you get inside where it's covered. You can see a lot of grain of formwork, nail heads, that kind of stuff. So uh, again, indicators that overall these arch ribs are in good condition. We might have some trouble spots, but overall we've got good, good condition. Those joints at the one-third point of the arch rib got some issues there. One of the days we were inspecting there was some rain overnight, so there was water and uh, again salt intrusion. This is a crack. But uh, again, we're not planning to just inject this. We're going to have to do something a little more uh, significant to repair that, get down to the rebar, and uh, put some patch material in there. Then as you get on the spring line of the arch rib, you see some scaling on the top of the arch rib. I kind of agonized a lot about this one. And 
uh, the discussion of getting things up to a seven earlier this morning with the DOT roundtable. I was thinking about this slide in particular. I wanted to repair this, but ultimately we just decided, you know, this is very minor. It's only a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, a little bit of indentation. Um, I think the root cause of this is actually due, due to the original construction because you actually had to form the top of the arch rib. Um, you can't just screed it off, and so it was difficult to consolidate the concrete. Um, it's been there for 90 years. I think it'll be okay for another 75. I wouldn't want a, an inspector to come in and look at that and say, oh, that's a six, you know, but um, my opinion is that's, that's still a seven. So I think uh, the, the cure would be worse than the disease in this, in this state, um, so we're going to probably leave this alone. Siva did some uh, <clears throat> coring for us. We had really good con concrete strengths, anywhere from 3,000 to 7,000 PSI. He did a chloride profile, petrographic analysis, uh, carbona carbonation check, um, whole nine yards uh, with that. Um, there's some phenolphthalein, uh, pink is good, no carbonation there, so that's good. Um, you know, all in all, uh, Siva's analysis was was uh, very good and, and showed that the structure is is in good condition, and we we can get a 75 year uh, service life out of this structure, or at least that's projected. We did a few visualizations uh, of the of the project to help out our historic folks. We met with the State Historic Preservation Office to make sure that they were on board with this project. Um, it was very well received there, uh, and so they're very excited about it. As far as conclusions, uh, again, eliminate as many joints as possible. Um, one thing that we did was we documented every defect with a photo, and we also had a sketch, it, you know, maybe a little bit overboard, but you'd need that level of detail in order to get an accurate quantity estimate for, for bidding purposes. Um, had the contractor in mind, thinking about him and wanting to make sure we could get everything as accurately as we could. <clears throat> we did decide to replace the piers all the way down to the spring line um, and rebuild there. It's only about 30 feet high, so um, it's, it's not a huge expense, and overall I think we're going to get a better product. And we're not, also not anticipating strengthening the arch ribs, although the low rating factors, closer to one, are at very concentrated areas right at the spring line. So if we had to, uh, we could do that relatively inexpensively, only at very specific locations. But again, hopefully not, not planning on doing that. As far as environmentally, this, uh, we went through another environment, uh, round with uh, environmental folks. This alternative was selected as the LEDPA. Uh, least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. Uh, we got no adverse effects upon the historic structure with conditions. In other words, we just need to maintain the, the historic character of the structure. We have an architectural historian in our office who is very helpful uh, as we were going through this. And we're also expecting to save uh, $4.3 million compared to the original plan of uh, constructing a new structure. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, beauty and architecture and art and economy are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So with that, are there any questions? Yes, sir. I got just one quick question, question over here. Many years, years ago, I got involved with the dash that was the engineer design that needed to have a sustainable arch bridge. bridge. And, and the problem with that bridge was that there was no articulated hinges a lot of the columns and a lot of cracking. And we found fake articulated hinges, but I don't want to get into those details. This is a presentation. I'm curious if we had an articulated hinge. You didn't mention it. Uh, and uh, if you had a column cracking issue, you should have to deal with You mean in the arch rib itself or the columns? In the, it's basically in the columns where it connects to the arch rib. It's usually a little circle of the notches or something. Yeah, um, there were no hinges in, in the columns or in the arch rib. Um, both of them were fixed. We did not see a lot of cracking. In fact, uh, our structural analysis indicated with uh, the arch rib 
it's it does not crack it's you know we used full section properties uh, we didn't reduce the section properties for, for cracking or anything like that and actually the spandrel columns were in still in very good condition as well we're going to probably demolish down we're, we are planning on demolishing down to uh, about right uh, right there we're going to demolish down to um, that pedestal but we didn't see any issues there. Those were those pedestals were in good condition, and the columns were in good condition. Right, right. Well, one of the we had problems with columns because of the fish and trash. This is the structure. There was also a column system. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that's the plan anyway. We might look at one or two, but um, for now we're going to leave the joints at the piers. Uh, NCDOT didn't want us to go overboard um, with that. Uh, it, it, was, it was painful to eliminate all those joints. It, it, was, it was very challenging analytically um, to, get all, to get that to work. So, um, so in, in Tennessee you did address that what Jeff was kind of alluding to is the, the differential uh, movements that you've got between the arch and the deck. Absolutely, yeah. We had to do a lot of different things in Tennessee. One of the things we did was we put a hinge at the base of the spandrel columns. Um, that that's was toward the spring line. We played a lot with the bearings. We used uh, stiffer bearings at the crown and used really flexible bearings at uh, towards the spring line. So um, we had to we had to pull a lot of tricks out of the bag in order to get that to work in, in Tennessee. This is 17 minutes long, so you might not, I, I'll let you decide if you want to stick around for the whole thing, but they did it's some extensive load testing as well before they bombed it out. Uh, the